Well, well, Robin, thank you. And can I just say to all of you that it is a huge privilege to be here uh, at Chatham House, because Chatham House has always led the way in shaping new thinking on Britain's place in the world. And with the general election less than two weeks away now, I thought there was no better place uh, to come and set out my case. And I want to set out a case on how I will seek to reshape our great country's relationship with our allies and our partners, and how Britain can play its role in overcoming the great global challenges that we face. Now, my argument to you today is a simple one. The next Labour government will stand up for Britain and ensure that our country takes a strong and confident place on the world stage. It's time to reject the small-minded isolationism that I believe has characterised this government, because I believe it is an approach that has shrunk our influence and weakened Britain. We need a government that is outward-looking, not inward-looking, optimistic about our role in the world, not pessimistic. But just as we should learn from the mistakes of this government, so too we should learn from our past too, including the 2003 Iraq War, recognising that we are always stronger, more effective, and have more authority when we work with allies across the world and seek to strengthen, not weaken, multilateral institutions. So standing up for Britain, speaking out for Britain, and using Britain's influence in cooperation with our allies, that's the essence of the foreign policy of the government that I hope to lead. And that's the approach I want to lay out for you today. Now, I know my first responsibility as Prime Minister will be to keep our country safe, because the threats we face are real, and I want to say something about them. But they're threats here at home and indeed abroad, from nuclear proliferation to ISIL, to Russia and Ukraine, to the changing balance of power between East and West, to the ongoing national security challenge that I believe climate change represents, to the terrible and heartbreaking scenes we've witnessed in the Mediterranean this week. These challenges reflect powerful global trends that any government, Labour or Conservative, must now confront. Forces that shape the world in which we all live. And I want to describe three of the trends that I think underlie what we see in our world. The first concerns the very complexity of the global challenges that confront us. Because as we all know, and as this audience would know better than most, the threats we now face are not generally the old threat from single states. They cross borders and boundaries. And they are more complex than the deeply dangerous but more traditional interstate rivalry of the past. It's true, of course, of ISIL, motivated by an evil ideology that recognizes no borders, but of course wants to establish a state of its own. It's true of the mass migration caused by conflicts that stretch across, stretch across entire regions, especially in North Africa and across the Middle East. And it's true of climate change, which threatens the future of everyone no matter where they live. All of these aren't traditional forces that we face. And what I take from that is it means that they can't effectively be confronted by any single state acting on its own. Not the United States, not China, not the United Kingdom, no country on their own. They can only possibly be tackled by concerted action by countries working together all around the world. But it's not just the complexity and transnational nature of the challenges we face that matters. The second trend means that we confront them at a time when the very institutions that we might rely on to help us confront those forces are themselves under more strain than they've been for generations. From the EU to the UN, the multilateral institutions that were crafted after the Second World War face more serious pressure than they have known before, both from outside their institutions and from within them with their reputation in part undermined by the challenge of a series of global crises to which they appear to have not been able properly to respond. From Iraq, more than a decade ago, to Syria today, to the continued stalemate in the search for peace between Israel and the Palestinian people. As well as a continued belligerence of states that seek to undermine the international order that these institutions are precisely designed to uphold. And then there's a third trend, as if this wasn't difficult enough, there's a third trend 
that makes things more difficult still. Because we live now at a time not only when international institutions are losing support, but when individual states themselves also find it harder to act. So many countries around the world are faced by serious budgetary constraints in the aftermath of the financial crisis, meaning their capacity and willingness to respond internationally has been dimmed. And others are undermined by deep and persistent struggles within their own population. For example, rightful demands for greater democracy, greater accountability, and greater equality, destabilizing old orders without straightforwardly <coughs> leading to stable reform. So in two weeks' time, any government will be facing the same challenges, some of the challenges that I've laid out. Threats which cost cross boundaries, international institutions under strain, states in all parts of the world facing difficulties of their own. Now, these global trends are unavoidable. That's true. But the crucial truth we must acknowledge is that the difficulty Britain faces in navigating this new global order, I believe, is being made far worse by decisions that our own government has made. My case is that David Cameron has presided over the biggest loss of influence for our country in a generation. And that has happened because the government he leads has stepped away from the world rather than confidently towards it. And I want to set out what I mean. Because I believe it's an approach that has shrunk our influence and weakened Britain. And the evidence for that is all around us. Take the situation of Russia and Ukraine. Was there ever a more apt symbol of Britain's isolation and waning influence than when David Cameron was absent as the leaders of Germany and France tried to negotiate peace with President Putin? And we've seen it this week with regard to the crisis unfolding in the Mediterranean. In Libya, Labour supported action to avoid the slaughter and stop the Gaddafi regime, the threats they made to Benghazi. But since the action, the failure of post-conflict planning has been obvious. David Cameron was wrong to assume that Libya was a country whose institutions could simply be left to evolve and transform themselves. What we've seen in Libya is that when tensions over power and resource began to emerge, they simply reinforced deep-seated ideological and ethnic fault lines in the country, meaning the hopes of the revolutionary uprisings quickly began, began to unravel. The tragedy is this could have been anticipated and it should have been avoided. And Britain could have played its part in ensuring the international community stood by the people of Libya in practice rather than standing behind the unfounded hopes of potential progress only in principle. Now, by far the most important cause of our loss of influence is the position of this government, I believe, in regard to the European Union. With the threat of an in-out referendum on an arbitrary timetable, with no clear goals for their proposed European renegotiation, no strategy for achieving it, and a governing party riven with internal divisions over our future in the EU including a foreign secretary who has actually openly advocated leaving the European Union. Now, I've just got to be candid with this audience, and we've seen it actually confirmed again by HSBC today. I think all of this poses a grave risk to Britain's position in the world. Of course the European Union needs to change. There are demands for it to change in almost every other member state, on immigration, on benefits, on the rights of national parliaments. And Britain should be leading the process of reform. But this government's approach to Europe means that even when Britain's interests are shared by other member states, EU leaders are reluctant to support us, in part because they think we have one foot already out of the door. That is bad for Britain. And our loss of influence in Europe leads to a further loss of influence in the world, from the United States to China. Here's what I think is the central case. We are stronger as a leading partner in the European Union, and we are weaker when we are not. I think one of the profound mistakes of Euroscepticism is to believe that we are somehow more influential with others if we depart the EU, when in fact the opposite is true. It is precisely our influence within the EU which makes us more influential in the world. That's what people in China say, that's what people in the United States say. Now, I think that none of this needed to be the case. Uh, in fact, the great irony of this situation is David Cameron says he wants us to stay within the European Union. He, he's pursued his strategy not because of any great political principle or ideal, because he says he believes in staying in the European Union. 
He's done it because he's been pushed there by political forces in his own party and by his fear of other political parties in our country. The rise of conservative Euroscepticism and UKIP has led him to this position. He's taken us to the edge of European exit because he's been too weak to control his own party and too anxious about the rise of UKIP, a rise he should have challenged but pandered to instead. And these problems have worsened dramatically, I've got to say to you, in the last few weeks. Because worried about losing power, the Conservatives are now trying to do everything they can to talk up the prospects of the Scottish National Party and pit English nationalism against Scottish nationalism. Now let me be clear, this is incredibly dangerous for our country. We shouldn't be turning one part of the UK against another. We should be standing up for the whole of the United Kingdom. We shouldn't be sweeping away what binds us together in favour of what emphasising what drives us apart. Or trying to obscure the real issue of this election, the kind of country we want to be at home and abroad. See, I believe the real task for Britain is not to divide between one nation and another, but to build a United Kingdom that works for all. Now, what's the link between these two issues? I think there is a link. A country that is working for people at home is a country that can be more confident abroad. And that is the kind of Britain that I believe in. And that is the kind of Britain that Labour believes in. A Labour Party that believes we should be proud and confident as to what our country can achieve in the world. And let me just say something now about this. We are and will continue to be one of the most capable global powers. What do I mean by capability? I mean we have the world's fifth largest defence budget, the second largest aid budget, and the fourth largest diplomatic network in the world. And we have the skills and the people able to deliver for Britain in the years ahead. Our military personnel who have served us so bravely in the conflicts of the last decade. Diplomats around the world, and I'm not just saying this because I'm at Chatham House, who are some of the best and brightest men and women serving any country in the world. The unparalleled reach and impact of the BBC World Service and our journalists. Now with such talent and reach, there is no reason for Britain to shrink from the world. So the goal of my government will be to ensure that Britain is unified at home and strong and confident and outward looking in the world. But I've just got to say, to do that, we need to re-engage in the world, not withdraw from it. To be willing to play our part, both to secure our interests and pursue our values. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to do this in the right way as well. And this is an issue about Labour's past. As we seek to re-engage in the world, we need to learn the lessons both of this government and of the government that went before. In particular, learning the lessons of the 2003 Iraq War. Now, for me, there are a number of lessons. For when military action is appropriate, because I believe it should be a last resort. For how we work through multilateral institutions and with regional partners, because I believe action is much more effective if that's what you do. And in ensuring there is always a plan for the peace. Now, these are some of the reasons I opposed the proposed intervention in Syria in 2013. So the task for us as a new government would be to begin working with our allies and partners in the community of nations once again in a genuine and hard-headed multilateralism, because that is what the times demand. What the world now needs is an organized and sustained solidarity between like-minded nations seeking to uphold international law. That was the way we rebuilt after the Second World War through NATO, the European Union, and the ECHR. Securing peace and promoting democratic values together. I believe that is what is at stake today. Now, Labour was proud to play a crucial part in shaping that order in the past as we emerged from World War II. The Labour government I lead will always seek to do that in the future. So what does this vision mean in practice? What would the concrete priorities be of an incoming Labour government as we sought to restore Britain's relationship with the world? There are, of course, many. We must maintain our independent nuclear capability with a continuous at-sea deterrent. We must work within the EU to help resolve the immediate crisis in the Mediterranean. Another huge priority, we must step up our efforts to help bring about the two-state solution in Israel and Palestine that is desperately needed. A secure Israel alongside a viable and independent Palestinian state. Because I believe this is a conflict that scars the region and the world and there can be no true stability in the world without its resolution. So these are crucial issues. 
And I want to outline three central tasks that I see in a little more detail. First, our mission will start by restoring our commitment to international institutions, the UN, NATO, the Commonwealth, and of course the European Union. I explained earlier that all of these institutions face huge challenges. We will seek to rebuild our influence. Now that starts with the EU. I want a clear message to be sent out to our European partners, that an incoming Labour government will be serious about leading once again in Europe and serious also about reforming Europe. We said that in the unlikely event of a transfer of powers from Britain to the EU in the next parliament, we'll have an in-out referendum. But we are certain of something very important, that Britain's future lies inside, not outside, a reformed European Union. We will never put our national interest at risk by threatening to leave. And we want to get on with the business of reforming Europe in a way that helps Britain and the EU as a whole. So an incoming Labour government will charge all of our European ambassadors with the pursuit of this clear European reform strategy. We also need to look beyond the EU, and that includes our commitment to NATO. NATO is and must remain the foundation of our defence and security partnership, and we will work tirelessly, tirelessly to ensure its greater effectiveness. Western unity and resolve are essential, as we have seen in the face of Russian aggression in the Ukraine. NATO needs to send signal, the signals of deterrence to prevent the line of confrontation being moved further west. And that includes signals from across the alliance, even when times are hard at home, that we remain committed to our armed forces. Now, I'm not going to set out a spending review today. Indeed, it's crucial that we complete our strategic defense and security review well before long-term spending decisions are taken to ensure we avoid the mistakes of the poorly conceived SDSR in 2010. But I want to be absolutely clear that amongst the reasons we reject the extreme conservative spending cuts is that they will be truly catastrophic for the future of our armed forces. The Institute of Fiscal Studies set out yesterday there would mean at least 18% reductions for departments like the MOD, significantly more than the cut to defense this parliament. Promises of protection which have been made for specific parts of the defense budget are meaningless in that world. They simply won't be delivered. That's why the prospect of these conservative cuts alarms our allies and our military personnel. Even conservative politicians with defense expertise recognize the dangers of what is planned. Now, I'm not going to pretend there won't be difficult choices in the years ahead as we deal with the deficit. And I won't repeat David Cameron's mistakes of making promises before an election, in his case of a larger army, only to break them in government. But we simply will not take the extreme approach our opponents propose. I'm not going to sacrifice the defense of our country on an ideological commitment to a smaller state. Indeed, we're in the unprecedented situation going into an election. It is now Labour that is much better positioned to find the resources our armed forces need to maintain our security in the next parliament. So first, we will recommit our country to the international partnerships that make it strong and allow us to respond to the challenges we face. Second, we will reconsider the place of military intervention in the way we respond to the world's problems. You know, today we face failed states and civil wars across the entire wider Middle East, from the Western Sahel through to Somalia and Sudan, from Yemen to Syria and Iraq, and in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Many of these places share key elements, weaken corrupt states lacking legitimacy, the growing influence of Islamist extremists, interstate rivalry, and limited progress towards democracy. All this matters for the UK, because these conflicts then spill over into Europe through terrorism, growing illegal immigration, organized crime, and they'll worsen if the conflicts intensify. So we must respond at home and abroad. We must do all we can to protect our borders, investing in capable intelligence and security services. We must, in my view, update the law surrounding internet communications, including with proper oversight. And we must ensure robust controls to prevent people traveling to take part in the Syrian conflict and to ensure those returning are properly managed. And we must respond by building partnerships abroad. Let me say something about ISIL. I think the challenge posed by ISIL's barbarism, which is something I believe unites our whole country, is the most pressing case we face. Following a request from the Iraqi Prime Minister, it was right the UK joined other nations in airstrikes against ISIL targets in Iraq. But military action alone will not defeat ISIL. We need a long-term multinational political strategy 
with regional actors playing a central role. That is essential to tackle extremism across the region. And as we do so, we will learn the lessons of previous intervention, not seeking to solve the world's problems on our own, but working with international, regional, and local partners. Any intervention must be carried out with a clearly defined strategy, and this must include a comprehensive transition and post-conflict strategy. These are the vital lessons of our recent past, and I won't forget them. Third, I want to say something about two other particular challenges, inequality and climate change. Both of those will be at the core of our agenda, not just because that is the right thing to do, but because it's vital for the long-term interests of our country. Labour will proudly lead the world in maintaining our commitment to giving 0.7% of gross national income towards international development. And when it comes to climate change, we will help set Im ambitious emissions targets for all countries, reviewed every five years, based on a scientific assessment of the progress towards the goal that the scientists tell us is the right goal, which is two degrees centigrade. That means a goal of net zero global emissions in the second half of this century. And we need transparent, universal rules for measuring, verifying, and reporting emissions, with all countries adopting climate change adaptation plans. And part of this challenge, this challenge perhaps more than any other, uniting countries across the world, is an equitable deal in which richer countries provide support to poorer nations in their efforts to combat climate change. Now, none of this will happen by itself. It will take concerted action by countries all across the world. And it will require Britain to play the kind of role that I was privileged to shape at the Copenhagen summit during the last government. 2015 is a big year for our general election, but it is also a very big year in terms of climate change. The UN summit in Paris later this year will be our chance to demonstrate again that we can make progress and that we can show what Britain can achieve. And, and one other thing I want to mention, our commitment to universal human rights will also be the heart of our foreign policy across the world. We'll appoint Lord Michael Cashman as our international LGBT rights envoy to help work towards the decriminalization of homosexuality. And we will appoint a global envoy for religious freedom and establish a multi-faith advisory council on religious freedom within the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Because we know the persecution of people for their religion across the world, including Christians, uh, is a massive issue that we must lead on. Let me say this in conclusion, friends. Our country faces a big choice, I believe, in just under two weeks. It's a choice between different ideas about how our country succeeds here at home, and we've set those out during this campaign, but it's also a choice about our country's place in the world. I believe the conservative view threatens to divide us internally and to weaken our position abroad. I believe it's quite a pessimistic isolationism that learns the wrong lessons from our past and undermines our nation's future. But there's a better Labour view that says we are stronger as a country when we look boldly, confidently outward to the world not turning in on ourselves or acting on our own, working with our allies but not for them. It's a genuine and hard-headed multilateralism with our values as a country at its core. That's how Britain can succeed. That's how Britain will make a difference. And I look forward to working with all of you to make it happen. Thank you very much.